My name is Lisa Supenko and I head Concilium Scientific and uh, I was Ellie's friend and colleague working with him for many years at NICE and um, today we are celebrating Ellie's birthday and uh, we are um, holding a scientific discussion uh, that Ellie started back in 2020 when I was just setting up Concilium. Ellie attended all of our events, was a great inspiration and help intellectual challenge for me. And um, he gave a talk on um, the historical and philosophical um, background of the nice threshold for decision making. Ellie being Ellie asked me not to make this talk public and we released it only a few weeks ago. You can watch it on YouTube. And um, in that talk, Ellie raised a lot of important questions that um, shape decision making that has been established in the UK over two and a half decades by now. So we would like to take this to another level and um, I welcome our wonderful panel. So uh, please um, join us for tonight's discussion. Ken, please go ahead and introduce yourself. So hello everyone, I'm Ken Patterson from Glasgow in Scotland. I'm a diabetes and internal medicine physician by, by training, but I became involved with our national uh, medicines HGA body, the Scottish Medicines Consortium. When it was founded, I went on to become the chair of, uh, of SMC. And then since leaving SMC, I've done a fair bit of work on the NICE scientific advice program. And that's what brought me into contact with, with, with Ellie. Richard, please. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Grieve. I'm a professor of health economics. I'm based at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I've also uh, provided early scientific advice to NICE. Um, and I met Ellie and Lisa and several other people on the call through that. And it's uh, a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Richard. Gianluca, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Gianluca Bai. I'm Professor of Statistics and Health Economics uh, at the Department of Statistical Science at University College London. And I, too, have collaborated and uh, do collaborate with NICE Early Scientific Advice, through which I met Ellie. And uh, Ellie and I also had lots of connections throughout the R4HDA consortium, of which I was a scientific director, and uh, we invited him to give one of his excellent talks at, at several of our, uh, of our workshops. Thank you, Gianluca. We were also planning to have uh, Professor Carol Longson with us today. Unfortunately, she's unwell and unable to join us, uh, but I hope she'll be able to watch this recording. So, um, all right, I would like to kick off the discussion with um, theoretical philosophical question for our panel. So as we know, um, many countries make successfully HDA decisions and they do not use the threshold. They don't use the empirical approach used by NICE. And um, do you think it's a problem? Do you think it's um, a tradition? Where is NICE perspective fitting into this? And um, I I'd, like to, I'd, I'd like to start with uh, Richard's view on that. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. It's it's an interesting one, isn't it? So we're all here because we're interested in in HGA, and I guess uh, my view on it as an economist is HGA has a, a couple of central cores. One is it originates, I think, with the idea of fairness. Uh, that without uh, say nice in the UK, we started from the premise of lots of postcode prescribing. So if Ken was based up in Scotland and I was in London, he or I might be more or less likely to receive the new uh, blockbuster treatment, and that would be unreasonable. Um, and similarly across different conditions, uh, if I had one condition, I might receive priority versus another not. And so the whole premise of cent centralized HGA to me is to try and avoid that fairness, but also uh, find uh, new medicines in particular that bring about uh, big improvements in outcome uh, for reasonable cost. And by cost as an economist, I have an eye on opportunity cost. So I'm aware of what else might be done with those same resources. And I suppose that brings me to being an advocate of a threshold uh, because my concern without such a threshold is that we might end up paying using a lot of resources for, for new technologies that appear to be innovative at the expense of uh, things that we might have on our NHS routinely uh, that carry less uh, 
uh, lustra and uh, would be uh, we'd be deprived of uh, were we to break uh, some sort of nominal threshold and start paying uh, 500,000 pounds for the shiny new drug and also the inequities that I think centralized HTA is very good at, at obviating uh, would come back to haunt us. So if, if Lisa and others said to me, actually, we're moving away, uh, we, we've, we've now gone away with a threshold altogether at NICE, I would be uh, very concerned. I'm sure we could get on to some debate about the level and the values. All I'll say on that, uh, just to finish off, is that it's not as if NICE went through some very careful deliberative process. I don't think from a whole bunch of economists uh, look very detailed at the empirics, so people have done uh, that subsequently. My recollection is that a Canadian physician, uh, name of Laupakas, uh, originally came up with the $50,000 per quality threshold, and when challenged at a conference and asked where he came up with that number from, uh, he didn't quite say, I made it up. Uh, but he just said it felt about right. So I think we have to be a little careful uh, to pretend that we've got a very clear empirical or theoretical basis on the level. Uh, and we might return to that uh, further on. But at least that's th those are my sort of overall thoughts on it. Thank you. Uh, Gianluca, what would be your response being a statistician looking at the numbers? Would decision making make any sense without them uh would you have any trust in it unsurprisingly um i think we've been um coming across each other for quite some time now and i can't remember the time that richard and i were in in, in strong disagreement so i don't disagree with what he's just said and uh, particularly the point about thresholds are important because they are part of a, of a bigger system that is designed to produce positive outcomes and positive effects which is to reduce the unfairness and uh, and to uh, equalize the provision of, of, of healthcare across different sectors of, of a given um, jurisdiction. What I would add, uh, on top of the fact that uh, you know, these numbers we come up with might have some rationale, but this rationale is not God-given, uh, as it were, and also it's not a once and for all. Often, particularly at the beginning of the history of HDA, which is reasonably and, and a relatively young discipline, um, this was the concept of a threshold which originated through the Anglo-Saxon uh, setups in Canada and then uh, the UK, perhaps, uh, has been kind of almost translated uh, at face value in, in, a, in a different currency. And, uh, and so this kind of translates into perhaps some of the criticism that we've we've highlighted already. The fact that these numbers look a bit like they're made up, they don't have to be made up. They can have some stronger rationale. And also we need to realize and recognize that they can be dynamic. We need to be able to, um, to change them if the, the, the overall circumstances change. And I think this speak also to the overall and wider point of uncertainty in the decision-making process, which perhaps we're going to uh, touch upon later on. Thank you, Gianluca. So Ken, a word to you. What does this threshold mean for a clinician uh, who needs to yep. talk to doctors? And uh, to a decision-maker like you, you've been in the situations when you had to uh, oversee the decisions made by the Scottish Consortium. Yes, I mean, I think a threshold is an extremely useful concept. So I'm in complete agreement, sadly, with Richard and John Lucas. It doesn't make for much of a debate. But um, but uh, I think the threshold gives a sort of point of reference, if you like. And it means that you can um, assess an individual medicine and then say, is this medicine something that we would normally be looking to, to introduce to the NHS? Is it something that we're willing to perhaps push the boat out a bit? We particularly want to use this medicine, but we're making that decision against a reference point. Without that reference point, um, and we've heard it already, you're then comparing different diseases, the impact of different interventions. And it's very difficult to be able to do that unless you've got some kind of central reference point against which to compare them. Yes, we, the clinical aspects are obviously very important to me, perhaps rather more important than the actual um, pound signs and numbers. Um, but in fact, it's, it's the clinical aspects that drive the health economic case anyway, rather than the actual pounds. So um, uh, the, therefore, from my point of view, having a threshold means that you've got something to work towards when you're assessing a medicine. The other thing also with a threshold, if I change sides a little bit, 
and pretend I'm working from the pharmaceutical industry uh, in terms of medicines or indeed a medical device agency or whatever, uh, product producer, having a threshold means that you know what your target is. You know, you, you know a, a company bringing a new medicine to NICE knows what NICE's decision is going to be, or at least can be pretty close to knowing that because it knows the process that NICE, NICE will go through. And while individual companies will throw up their hands in horror and express surprise and so on and so forth, you know, I, I don't believe any of that. They all know what the decision is going to be. And that's what the threshold does. It gives that degree of certainty, that degree of transparency of the process. That you come into the process, you can not guess the outcome, you can actually calculate the outcome of, of the HTA process. Um, and it also, by having a single threshold across diseases, with exceptions, obviously, perhaps for orphan medicines and so on, but having a single threshold ensures the equity that Richard was talking about, that you are not accidentally favouring one disease over another. It still allows the committee, if they wish, to favour one disease area over another, but it makes that very clear and transparent. They know they're doing it. And as a chair, I would challenge them to ask them why they were doing it. But if that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. But it gives that reference point, which I think is so important. Thank you, Ken. So uh, all of you have been um, exposed to nice decision making or the birth of HTA for uh, many years. So you've seen, um, can you must remember the world before um, NICE and um, Scottish Medical Consortium, how decisions were made and uh, the current situation? Over 25 years, have you seen the changes? Uh, how, do you think HTA or decision making at NICE became a more of a political tool or it's still uh, an empirical nitty gritty process? Um, what, what, what has been the emotional trend around it? I mean, if you want my take on that, just, I mean, I think the bottom line is it, it, there's a little bit of a difference between us in Scotland and, and NICE. NICE is, is an, a, 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 a a construct of the Department of Health in England, whereas in fact SMC was a clinical construct. It claimed from the clinical community, people like me. In both areas, there was a bit of resistance to it at the start. Clinicians didn't like being told what to do and so on. What's been interesting, I think, over really over the first 10, 15 years, it's now so well established, that people have come to accept it. And they realise that going back to the old days, when new medicines went to the people who shouted loudest, went to the people who, as we would say, did the most shroud waving, you know, this med, people will die and so on. So on. That has, that's gone. You don't see any of that anymore. The early days of SMC, we were always on the front pages of the newspapers when we said no to something. We haven't been on the front page of a newspaper in Scotland for a decade. People just accept it. Clinicians accept it. Patient groups accept it. Um, even politicians accept it. Um, so I think there's been a big cultural shift, but it's a cultural shift for the better because it means that you have an objective and transparent process. Uh, when you were talking, can I just realize how much I miss that life where you have nice or SMC decision on the front page of a newspaper, whatever it is on, on your screen. Now we live in a world which brings us much, much worse news. So there's no, no space, even if nice SMC made an unpopular decision. So Richard, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, it tends to provoke me a little bit because uh, obviously these are terrible times uh, for the world at the moment, but if we don't ever see uh, NICE or SMC on the front pages, does that mean our threshold is too lax, too high, I wonder? Um, I mean, I, I, I remember earlier on with NICE, uh, there was some concern that the threshold was, was too lax, and even economists would argue, well, NICE has got to work. You know, if politically uh, NICE gets hammered and it gets shut down, then we're back in a really bad place. Um, but but more, I think, going back sort of three or five years ago when the York Group were writing a lot about the threshold and writing a lot about this notion of opportunity cost and that, look, for £20,000, uh, we could get so many cancers diagnosed earlier. We could get so many... Uh, scans done and back to people that we wouldn't be worried about end stage cancer treatment. We would have people having early stage curative therapies, for example. The real questions were being asked as to whether we were spending too much on uh, new technologies and too little on uh, preventative medicines, for example. And I think that 
debate was a useful one, uh, but wasn't finished uh, and never will be finished. But I suppose a question I would have for for Ken and for Gianluca um, is whether you think that debate should be um, re-energised. Um, and yeah, if the threshold is too high, that would be my personal view that I think it is. I think this is a very interesting point and uh, actually highlights that there, there's a lot more to this process than just focusing on the threshold. The threshold perhaps is an easy thing to isolate and to discuss and to create a debate about because it is an important parameter, it's something that it's really hard to come up with uh, from a from a, an empirical rationale. You could do it, and there have been uh, attempts at doing that. But even then, they're modeling based, and there's been criticism of the way in which we've we've, we've reached that kind of conclusion. But there's so much more, actually, if you start looking at it. Because, for example, we take it for granted that our in in our decision making process, where we we uh, we use the utility measure, which is given by the monetary net benefit which does depend on the threshold, but it does also have a set form, which has all sorts of advantages from the mathematical point of view. It's a linear form, it's easier to make calculations with, but also it does have some underlying assumptions, which we just swipe under the carpet and we pretend that maybe that they're not to be discussed. When we use that utility function, which we always do, we're assuming that the decision maker is, uh, is, is neutral to risk, when in reality, probably they're not. And actually, the decision maker is, cares a lot, is, is averse to risk. Uh, they don't want to put a, a, a new drug through the market if there's too much uncertainty on the clinical side of things. And that is almost completely um, sort of not considered in, in any debate. So I think it's important that we keep this alive. My, my answer to your question, Richard, would be this has to be an unfinished business and probably will never be a finished business. But that's in the nature of of this beast, I think. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, I mean, I would totally, totally agree with that. You said, do we need to reopen the debate? And the answer is yes, we should, we should never have closed it down. I mean, what we need actually is to expand health technology assessment, to take in screening, to take in diagnostics, to take in non-medicine interventions and so on in a bigger way to try and see the big picture. Both NICE and SMC particularly are guilty of only looking at new medicines. And uh, now the manufacturers of new medicines say, well, that's biased against them and that's not fair. But it's also not fair on the wider healthcare system, which is, you know, particularly in England, where nice decisions actually have a kind of legal basis, if you like, that they have to be enacted. It means that medicines have a have a different um, uh, push behind them compared to other technologies and so on. So I think the way forward, as, as Richard's alluded to this, is to actually broaden the debate here and say that we need to look at the way we spend resource across the entire healthcare system and use an HTA type process to compare a new medicine with a new screening program, with a new implantable device or whatever. And that's not going to be easy. Um, but again, I think you're going to have to have some kind of reference point, call it a threshold if you want, that you would then allow, allow you to evaluate in a systematic way, um, evidence-based way, all of these possible interventions. Um, interesting comments in the chat. Maybe you've seen the comment from Francois. I wanted to read it. Um, I have the impression that the threshold is now more used to enter into price negotiations with companies rather than a tool used to recommend or not recommend technologies in prime decisions. Uh, so that points that it's becoming a political tool. But my question, if you have comments on that, uh, happy to hear them. But when you say uh, we need to continue this debate or, um, or engineer this debate, who is behind it? Is this another publication by an academic group or should it be at another level? Uh, I'll have a swing at that and a couple of other things that are coming up in the chat. I think that NICE was very innovative uh, in its inception uh, around methods. Um, I think for the first five to 10 years, no HG agency in the world could, could have better claim to innovation. I'm not totally convinced that in the last uh, decade or so that that can be the same claim. Uh, so I think there's been marginal uh, examples of innovation. But something around the threshold, I think that um, that was also a very political issue as well. And I think in a way that's where the most 
exciting uh, methods and advances can be made. So put bluntly, academia really upped its game with cost effectiveness analysis uh, on the inception of NICE and other agency agencies because it really mattered. And the standards went up hugely, you know, evidence synthesis, uh, uh, utility elicitation, models, you know, these are all things that were minority sports for a lot of people in the late 90s, uh, mid 90s. And then suddenly it had to be ready for prime time. Um, but I think some nuance around uh, the threshold method, some nuance around uh, where uncertainty uh, collides with um, other aspects of decision uh, criterion and how that all comes through, not so much as a threshold, but a set of decision rules. I think some of that thinking uh, needed to go wider than a fairly sort of pacey task and finish methods review. And other HTA agencies, um, I think, have a ton to offer in that regard as well. I think I, I again, um, this is becoming a bit boring, perhaps, but I really do agree with Richard's point here. And uh, actually, I see a question in the chat, how can NICE be more innovative? And I think that there are prime examples of that. For example, the Dutch regulator and the Canadian regulator have recently reviewed their guidelines trying to improve and open up to different tools used for the decision-making analytic process. For example, using open access software, proper statistical software. And again, I'm showing my bias here because I come from statistics, but I think that sometimes we see in HDA some kind of divorce between the two sides of the story. There's the effectiveness analysis that the sort of the clinical analysis that is done with very high standards that are kept from the sort of more medical biostatistics uh, arena, for example, and the economic evaluation is often not an afterthought because obviously it's well established, but it comes after that uh, rather than at the same time. It's not designed most of the time to be done at the same time. And some of it is transpiring in terms of the tools that people tend to use, not, of, not all the time, but often. Um, and I think, again, this is the point of innovation that could be easily be brought into nicest decision making, nicest guidelines, and that would actually swing a lot more because historically that's what happened. And the other point that I wanted to make very quickly is, again, uh, around something that has been said, is not just that the debate about the threshold or other forms of, of our process uh, should never stop, is that often we think we've done the assessment, something has gone through NICE or a panel in any way, and then we're done which we most definitely aren't because while given current evidence, we might have enough or not evidence to say that this drug should be reimbursed, then that's based on current evidence and current evidence might be uh, subject to huge uncertainty. And so often this would actually open up to a new stage of the development process where in fact, things are tested in the real world and then we reassess continuously our decisions. Thank you, Gianluca. Yes, very good question about NICE being more innovative. I feel it's so innovative, I can barely keep up with all the, all the changes. Um, so uh, that leads me to a previous question from Francois uh, in terms of the all the updates trying to stay um, in fashion NICE makes to its methodology, especially to highly specialized technologies program, uh, to the, all the modifiers that have been recently introduced. Do you think it compromises the initial objective of what the threshold must have meant and the way of decision making uh, and the stringency of decision making? I'm afraid I would have to say that I would agree with Francois there. I think that the problem is that, and it's something that we do in the UK continuously, we invent a perfectly good process and then we invent various ways of bypassing it and getting around it and so on. Um, you know, I do think that we have to. I'd be very clear if we are going to provide different thresholds for different areas, why we're doing that. What is the underlying ethical principle that, for example, we've seen it with the cancer drugs fund, that cancer is such a special disease. Now, I mean, people die of cancer, but they die of heart disease, they die of respiratory disease and so on. You know, cancer is just another way of dying if I've, or for, for many people. Why would you want to be particular, you know, give particular regard to that? Why does having a particularly rare disease mean that you should get special consideration nowadays with NICE by a factor of 10. Whereas if you're unfortunate enough to have a common disease, then NICE doesn't want to spend money on you and so on. 
So I'm slightly concerned that ha you know, having a single threshold was, I mean, it never was a single threshold, but at least gave you this point of reference. My concern now is that what we're doing is, if you like, bypassing a lot of that, and that that actually undermines the objectivity and the equity approach that NICE, and for that matter, my co colleagues at SMC had in the past. We've been just as guilty in Scotland of trying to, trying to find a way to say yes. It's interesting when people say, why can't NICE be more innovative? What they're basically saying is, why can't NICE find a way to say yes to my medicine, even though it's not cost effective? That, that to me, is what, is what innovation for SMC and NICE looks like. And I just, I'm not sure, I'm ag agreeing with some people in the chat, I'm not sure that that kind of innovation is actually what NICE and SMC should be aiming for. Um, thank you. Yes, good point from Francois saying, noting that uh, uh, NICE has not de declined many or any products for the lack of clinical effectiveness. As long as it's affordable enough, it, it, it can go through. And that's also a question of the mandate of their organization. And it was actually politically, I think it's very interesting because when I was inside NICE, I um, did have many reservations on some points of decision making, some bits of methodology, uh, and then I quickly realized just how it all comes um, in your mind differently when you start comparing things. And obviously, decision making in the U.S. is such the opposite um, end of the spectrum that you start appreciating how much NICE is doing for the U.K. healthcare system to really keep pricing somewhat reasonable and that gets to the point that was made by Ben Purchison um, in the chat saying there's so many other things which might improve public health or health uh, rather than just new drugs but nice does not exist there to find uh, the best solutions for the healthcare uh, overall um, it, it has capacity to look only at some bits and aspects and there should be someone responsible for making decisions for the new and uh, expensive products. So um, a very good points. So there's the point from Eric, so that we should be pursuing, pushing for better evidence and better inputs into HTA, not trying to fix the evidence practice. Um, and um, now real world evidence became um, very, very popular. Um, it is a very useful tool in many ways, but it almost became a TikTok of HTA these days. It uh, became uh, something to uh, promote, to rely on, and uh, NICE is welcoming that. But I wanted to check with you, Richard and Gianluca and Ken, what, what, what is your vision, um, how it should be incorporated? Are we going too far with, um, with it or it's the future? Uh, so I guess my view is that NICE, it's still a bit part player. Uh, indeed, there's there's data that says about 20% of uh, single technology assessments are nowadays making use of uh, real world evidence. And by that, I mean uh, non-randomized trials for the assessment of uh, clinical effectiveness. So 80% have still got a trial there behind it or a network meta-analysis or something. So I guess um, it's still a minority sport, but it's growing. And I guess often it's seen as, as very negative from methodologists that because you've lost randomization, you've compromised uh, so much. Um, and I suppose my take on it is uh, you can have very, very, very good uh, real world evidence studies. The concern when they're in the hands of a life sciences uh, uh, firm is that they can be biased uh, in ways in favor of their product. And in fact, when I talk to a lot of people in the life sciences industry, they're very wary um, of using real world evidence uh, to assess comparative effectiveness. So I suppose my overall take on it is that it has to be done very, very, very well. And we spend hundreds of millions of pounds on clinical trials, but we spend relatively little money on doing uh, comparative effectiveness from non-randomized sources with anything like the same standards and rigor. And yet the potential is vast. 
not just for cutting R&D, but for being inclusive in terms of the patients, the outcomes, uh, the longevity of the measurement and so on. So I think there's a big onus on HGA to up its game in this. Um, and I could uh, go on and on and uh, start selling my own wares on this. But but basically, I think we are with real world evidence where we were with trial based evaluation back in the early 90s. Huge opportunity, but huge need for rigor and care in the way that it's used, evaluated and rolled out. Gianluca, as a statistician, how will we deal with rigor here? I think. This is super interesting, and I know we're hating the words innovation and innovative, and uh, I don't disagree with that, but that's the kind of thing that we need to be on the lookout. The methodology changes that are, are, are sort of drawn onto us because of how the data become available and, uh, and cost effective to use. For example, there's something that I see when I am in the early stage um, um, advice at NICE, which I'm sure is very, very different. And I know actually is very, very different from the final panel. But at the level of the early stage, uh, companies are not um, completely contrary to uh, the expert pushing and just saying, well, the, the trial that you're running will not tell you all that you need to know. You will be forced to have a follow up of whatever many years. And you know that for the cancer that you're trying to treat, that will be just, you know, um, your survival curves will not even hit 50%. And so your data will not be mature enough. So you have to complement that. You have to try and get more information from other sources. And they do get that. But obviously, then the, the, the conversation becomes different at the point of the final panel. Um, and I agree that the rigor has to mean uh, some sort of step up in the methodology that we use and that we are able to recognize as a community. So again, from my own biased view and from my perspective, we need more of the statistical models that are used in other, in other areas and are kind of established and perhaps we're kind of somehow sometimes lagging behind in, in terms of the overall uptake and the overall um, reception that, may, that there may be in, in our world. Thank you. Kevin, any thoughts from you? On yes, I mean, I think that the, the use of real world evidence is, you know, a, is a big step forward because we know that almost all medicines are less good in the real world than they are in clinical trials and almost always have more adverse events in the real world than they have in clinical trials. And we need to find some way of getting a handle on that. We'll not be able to do that at launch of a medicine, but we can hopefully with advances in IT and so on, capture some of those data um, maybe two, three years down the line and look to see to what extent, for example, a survival curve uh, whether cancer medicine is actually matching the clinical trial and to what extent it's not. And we won't have comparative data, but we can at least then say the actual outcomes with this medicine are as good as the clinical trial or are less good than the clinical trial. And that's relevant from a nice it's SMC perspective because it obviously in influences cost effectiveness, but it's also very important clinically because in fact, if the medicines are not proving to be as good in real world use as they were in clinical trials, then the question that clinicians and patients have to ask is, do we actually want to use this medicine? Is the balance of benefit and risk with this medicine actually still favoring benefit rather than risk? And I think the public think that we're doing all that. If you ask, you know, we, we've done this, you ask the general public who's monitoring the effects of medicines, they say, oh, the healthcare system and so on, whereas we're not at all to any great extent. We're just beginning to know. And um, uh, I'm hopeful that with the, the sort of the evolution of big data and all that kind of thing, that we will eventually be able to maybe, and it, maybe as John Luca and Richard have said, may take five or 10 years, but we will in fact be able to go to the public five years after a medicine's come on the market and say, this stuff is proving to be really good, or this stuff is sadly nowhere near as good as it appeared. And both from a cost effectiveness point of view, but also from a clinical point of view, we would need to reassess the whole place of the medicine in, in, in therapy. Thank you, Ken. So uh, continue on your idea of finding good stuff out there. So a very good comment from Francois saying, if we want to have better medicines, we should rely um we should really reward 
products which provide most clinical benefits, even at a higher threshold. So in Germany and in France, there is a practice of establishing additional clinical benefit and uh, reporting it and quantifying it. NICE in their defense say, well, we do calculate additional qualities for a given intervention, but these are different things, the way this additional clinical benefit is established and it does result sometimes in approval of medicinal products which are cheaper but not bringing additional clinical benefit. That's a very difficult issue because there's a lot of value in Me Too products as alternatives for patients because of uh, um, alternative modes of action they may offer to the patient. Uh, the question is the price. So the price, is, you know, everyone is happy for alternatives as long as they're cheaper or costed the same. Uh, the presentation of it is often misguided. So. Uh, a question to the panel, considering that there are different approaches in other countries, uh, my suspicion is that very similar drugs into the markets across Europe and the UK, and the recipe that you use to, to make the decision might not matter in the end, or does it? Well, I think it does in different countries. In the UK, I'm not speaking for nice here, in Scotland, if your drug is the same as the existing drug and is the same price, then the answer is, why wouldn't you allow people to use it? If it gives choice, it maybe has you know some advantages for some patients. Um, in some countries, if you're the second in class to the marketplace, you have to be 15, 20% cheaper than the first, uh, first for example, Austria, I know, has a very strict system that, that you know, this, the second drug in a class has to be 15 or 20% cheaper than the first. And that doesn't matter. It, it can be a whole lot better than the first in class. Very often, second in class drugs are better than the first in class. It doesn't matter if it's twice as good as, it still has to be 15% cheaper. And that, that does seem to me to be a little bit unfair if you've taken the trouble to develop a really good new drug. Um, uh, that you shouldn't be able to be even rewarded at the same level as the, as the existing therapy. Francois raised an interesting issue elder, earlier on when he wasn't talking about gravitational waves as he is now, um, but he raised an interesting issue of should we actually have a higher threshold for drugs that have real advances, that real, give real clinical benefit? Possibly. But interestingly, the drugs that we've looked at in recent times that have had the biggest clinical benefits, I'm thinking here of the anti-TNFs and biologics in inflammatory disease, things like the checkpoint inhibitors in oncology and so on, most of them have actually achieved a standard threshold because their, their clinical efficacy is so great that it justifies the price that's, that's being charged. If companies develop really innovative and effective products, the initial, the current nice threshold shouldn't scare them because the law must certainly come in, come in under it, unless they attempt to really quite ridiculously overprice, and that's that's that has to be avoided. But so I don't know that there's a need for a higher threshold for really innovative drugs. They kind of sell themselves just by the magnitude of their clinical benefit. Most new clinical medicines offer only very tiny steps. Um, in, in terms of, of clinical improvement, if indeed any clinical improvement at all. So where do you think um, orphan drugs or ultra-orphan drugs fit into all this discussion? It is part of nice decision-making. Uh, should, should it be? Or it's such a special case for such a small group of people that uh, it's been outside of NICE for quite some time? Was it right to be a separate decision-making or not? I guess it comes into the highly specialized technology route sometimes. And there, I suppose, um, I don't find myself in direct dis uh, disagreement with Ken. I can see why we've ended up with a threshold 10 times that for the standard to try and still incentivize the, the R&D. And maybe this is a place where looking at things on a country by country basis gets problematic because, you know, um, a global global pharmaceutical company that wants to invest in an orphan drug, they've got to get their payback somehow. And if we were to impose those same 
threshold, certainly unilaterally, what, where would the incentive be to develop those, those drugs? So I suppose the innovation bit does need to come in somewhere. Um, I think the way that it's usually been handled as being part of the wider decision rule above and beyond the threshold, uh, to me, that's always seemed uh, somewhat reasonable. Um, but yeah, um, I can see um, why that might seem irrational and illogical to my general point of opportunity cost, because clearly there's huge opportunity costs going on those technologies. Um, uh, Richard, you made an interesting and kind of common point that about incentivizing R&D and what NICE should do to make sure the industry is happy and willing to bring products to the US, to the UK. Um, how much UK is a trendsetter? I mean, it's a 50 million um, market. Um, it's not where the pharma makes top money. So whether so is is this about incentivizing R and D or is the focus making sure patients in the UK have the access? I think for me, perhaps um, Ken and Richard and others might be more um, suitable to answer that question. But I think the way that I see it is that obviously there's a lot of interplay in the in the global. Um, in the global sense, because of course, NICE still have a lot of clouds. So if you get your approval through NICE or reimbursability through NICE, then that kind of carries some weight when you go and try and get approval or reimbursement in other jurisdictions. So the UK is probably a bigger market for pharma than at face value, uh, perhaps. Uh, but again, maybe this is something for other people to have more expertise on. What I wanted to say, in fact, is... Um, related to some of the points that have been um, raised, which is to do with how we can link HDA with the elements of research prioritization, which we do in principle, but not necessarily all the time in practice. There's a, a whole set of theory and methodology related to the value of information analysis, which I think is super relevant, and we should use a lot more of it. Um, and uh, what it would do is to actually decide uh, in terms of um, even at the clinical level, we don't necessarily need to have an RCT um, powered for specific recognition of a set effect, because that is, is not what we're after in the wider picture. What we should have is whether to gain that specific set of information from a specific design on a specific population, does that get us a value in terms of the information that we would collect? Would we make a better decision with that? The decision being on whether we should or shouldn't actually pay for a given drug or put it on the market or whatever healthcare intervention. So that would have a lot more relevance in the case of orphan drugs, for example, where the, the pool of individuals who might be affected is smaller by definition, but there might be a huge amount of information and therefore value in, in actually prioritizing some of that research, some of that specific research. Maybe an RCT isn't the best way to do research in that particular area because it would take a sample size that would, um, you know, would take 20 years to accrue to get any sort of reasonable power. But again, a dynamic process based on uh, placing this research prioritization and the value for information that you buy with the study might be a way forward. Thank you, Gianluca. Ken, what, what would be your feedback? What is nice to Scotland? Let's not take even global. What is nice to Scotland? Well, obviously, nice technically. It's nothing to Scotland because it's, a, it's an English organisation and we pay no attention to it. But that's actually being a bit, a bit unkind. I mean, I think the, the issue of orphan drugs and so on is interesting. And I alluded to this tenfold increase in, in threshold. I think that orphan drugs do need to be given special care and attention. Whether they need that amount of special care and attention is, I think, up for grabs. Because these are rare diseases, the clinical trials are generally going to involve tens of patients, maybe a hundred patients, something like that. And people say well, it costs the same to develop that drug as it costs one where you've got a clinical trial of 10,000. And I'm afraid I just can't buy that. It's just That's just not going to be the case. Also, orphan manufacturers have patent exclusivity that lasts longer and so on. So my concern just is I can see the need to support orphan drug development, but I just wonder whether using the health service budget in an inefficient fashion is the way to do that? Or are there other ways of supporting the pharmaceutical industry through 
research funding, through um, industry funding and so on, so that in fact it's not other patients in the healthcare system that are, if you like, suffering in order to develop the orph or orphan medicine. So I just think we maybe need to be a bit more imaginative um, about uh, how we support um, a new highly specialised technologies, because it would apply to non-drug technologies um, uh, as well. All right, friends. So I started answering my next question to the panel. Um, he's saying, I believe that with the MHRA rubber stamping, some authorizations from the FDA is from January of next year. Uh, NICE might have to reconsider its decision-making processes and maybe consider not reimbursing products with marginal added clinical value. I mean, very, very wishful thinking. It's very <laughs> theoretical and how uh, with current methodology, this can be achieved uh, uh, very questionable. A lot of times we find out about this true additional clinical value much later um, after the decision is made. And uh, um, do we ever reverse it or do we just say, well, well, it's an alternative or let it be there. Uh, that's, um, uh, but that was Francois's vision for, for 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 the future in terms of upcoming changes. And Nice has undergone massive changes with uh, Brexit and um, uh, a new realm of operation. So, what would be your vision for Nice for let's not take next twenty five years. This is too so far away that I cannot possibly think of it. But let's think about five years. So, do you think more methodological changes are needed? Or, and what, what do you think can be done practically? And what would be your more wishful thinking where you realize it would be nice to have, but it might not happen? So Richard, would you like to go first? Yeah, so I think NICE should um, be given more resources to do its work better rather than to be cut back uh, in the sort of MHO, MRSA model. Um, I think that by more resources, I mean to tackle big problems. Real world evidence is one, threshold is another, uh, to be able to scrutinize and deal with those well. Linked to that, if I had a magic, you're offering me a magic wand at this point in the seminar, I would I would lavish uh, public private money um, on uh, big data. Uh, so there's an initiative, Our Future Health, which has been talked about quite a bit, 4 million uh, volunteers uh, agreeing for their blood to be taken to find out all about their genetic and other dispositions for future illness uh, with uh, follow-up for them on their sort of therapeutic options. Industries uh, pumping uh, hundreds of millions of pounds in it to more than match government funding from it. Now, wouldn't it be nice if that also generated huge uh, drug databases, huge uh, patient outcome databases, other things that, uh, if you will, phase five HGAs of the sort that I think Ken and, and Gianluca are mentioning uh, were available at the download of, a, of an external review group looking to scrutinize a company submission. So I think much more sort of fluid real world HGAs, if I can overuse that word one more time, um, would be great. Thank you, Richard. Jean-Luc, what would be your uh, wishful thinking and pragmatic thinking for NICE for the next five years? I think the wishful thinking mostly would be in, in terms of stalling the definitiveness of the process somehow. So like I said, so I, I think that one of the biggest problems that we have is that we, we present a mathematical model onto the panel and uh, that is far from reality, that is just nowhere near reality. It's just our way of dealing with something that is so complex that we don't know any better. But we still interpret it sometimes as if it were the truth. And so if the results of that model are positive for us, then we're done. And I think that should not be the case. I understand that there are other issues and other uh, pressure points. And of course, companies on one hand need to have that decision made and, and, and possibly a positive decision because then that they move on and they have competitive advantage on the market. So of course that's that's a given, but I think that a compromise there would be very, very valuable, both as a wishful thing and a pragmatic uh, perspective. Because most often, I think that the decisions get made when we assume that there's only a binary outcome. You can either say yes or no to a drug, but there is a third option, which is maybe, uh, but we still don't know. So we need to get more data. And to get more data, I think that links back to what Richard was saying in terms of 
Well, okay, the, the RCTs need to be the, the, the bedstone of all of this development because they have to, and because most of the times they are, but we need to complement that kind of information with more data because even the best RCT, again, if you go back to the, um, to the drug development in, in oncology, you do the best RCT you can possibly do, and still you have all sorts of issues because the follow-up doesn't get you all the way to understanding what the survival curve is over the long period of time that you need to do the economic evaluation. Uh, you may have treatment switching and crossing because, because you do, and that kind of invalidates many of the assumptions that you have in the analysis of your standard model. So again, I think that what should happen leaving aside some of the more political complications, is this idea of we come to this model as the next step of the evaluation rather than the end point of the evaluation. Thank you, Gianluca. So again, wishful thinking and practical thinking from you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, wishful thinking would be that NICE and SMC were left to get on with their job and politicians kept their nose out of it because they don't really understand it and they don't really want to understand it. Um, they're much better to leave it to people who do understand it, but uh, they find that very hard, I realise that. I'm in total agreement with my two colleagues that I think at the present time, both NICE and SMC make decisions on the best evidence they can get, but they know that as they're making those decisions, as I say, they are not actually decisions based on what will happen in the actual clinical practice of, of, of medicine in, in Scotland or England or elsewhere for that matter. And I think therefore seeing an initial assessment process at NICE at SMC as part of a longer ongoing assessment of efficacy and, sa and safety for that matter is uh, very important, particularly as we're getting more potent, more effective drugs, but also drugs that carry with them greater um, risk of adverse events and so on. So I think we need to, to take a, a more lifetime perspective on drugs, which is what the pharmaceutical industry say they do. But at the bottom line is SMC and NICE tend to take a snapshot rather than a lifetime. Um, so I'm total agreement that with better data sets, as we've heard talked about, that's what we should be, be, be able to do. And the other thing I mentioned earlier on is it would be nice to see the same hot light of cost effectiveness turned on other interventions other than just, just medicines, that to include not just interventions, but to include um, uh, screening programs and diagnostics and so, so on, which tend to be ignored or simply assumed to be a good thing, um, which uh, we know with all the false positives on MRIs and things like that, that they actually generate as much ill health as they probably solve. And uh, so I think we need to be able to stand back a bit more and be a bit more critical about everything we do.